Welcome to this lecture. Ignatius 500 from Peru to Mars, New Walls and Jesuit Science by Brother Guy Consolmagno of the Society of Jesus. As you know, this year we celebrate the 500th anniversary of Ignatius of Loyola's conversion and the 400th anniversary of his canonization. In order to get deeper in Ignatius' figure and legacy, the Center for Ignatian Spirituality has organized a series of lectures, being this one, the first one of them. At the end of the lecture, I will advertise the next one, just in case anyone wants to come to the, to the other one, okay? There will be also food, so you are always welcome. Also, <clears throat> feel free to, to take one of these colorful cards that you have found in front on, on your table. You are allowed to take one and only one, okay? There are 22 different uh, cars, and the more lectures that you will come, the more you will be able to complete the, seat, the set of cars, okay? So that's the idea. Um, uh, I hope... So now, um, let me introduce Father Sayo Peel, the rector of the Jesuit community, and he will introduce his fellow friend and colleague, Father Guy. I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Brother Guy Consumano. And as uh, Tomeo has just mentioned, uh, this is a, a series of talks uh, in, sponsored by the Center for Ignatian Spirituality do this Ignatian year. Um, the, this year celebrates the 500th uh, anniversary of the conversion of Ignatius. And that conversion transformed Ignatius from a, a broken and wounded soldier into a religious leader whose influence and inspiration to serve God lives on in Chestnut Hill on the Heights. Brother Guy is a, uh, an American research astronomer physicist, planetary scientist, author, a Jesuit brother, the director of the Vatican Observatory, and the president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. Guy started his education here in the Commonwealth, earning both a bachelor's and master's degree uh, across the river at MIT. He was awarded a PhD in planetary science at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. He did uh, postdoc work at Harvard and MIT. Guy, Guy's research is centered on the connections between meteorites and asteroids, and the origins and the evolution of small bodies in the solar system. I'm grateful to have uh, been a collaborator of his for the last 15 years in his efforts to explore the physical and, and thermal properties of meteorites that land here on the Earth. It can be said that Guy will go to great lengths for science and research. In 1996, he took part in an NSF-sponsored Antarctic search for meteorites where he discovered hundreds of meteorites on the ice fields of Antarctica. While he serves as the director of the Vatican Observatory and the president of the Vatican um, Observatory Foundation, he was the past chair of the Division for Planetary Sciences for the American Astronomical Society and was also awarded the Carl Sagan Medal for Outstanding Communication by an active researcher to the general public by the Division of Planetary Sciences. Discovery and communication are the hallmarks of his life's work. He's a popular speaker and an author of many books. Some of the titles will give you a sense of his questions and efforts in life. Turn Left at Orion, Brother Astronomer, Adventures of a Vatican Scientist, Intelligent Life in the Universe, Question Mark, Catholic Belief and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life, and finally, God's Mechanics, how scientists and engineers make sense of religion. An asteroid is also named in honor of Guy. Um, it's 4597 Consomagno. And so today, let us welcome our speaker. Thank you all for coming. And uh, for many of us, this may be the first live talk we've been able to encounter in a couple of years. I want to give a, a shout out to some of the people who have helped me in this talk. I'm an astronomer, not a historian, but a lot of this is going to be history. So I relied on especially a book by the Jesuit 
uh, Augustin Odias, who wrote uh, books on Jesuit uh, science and Jesuit observatories. Likewise, a historian of science at the Vatican Observatory, uh, <clears throat> Ileana Canici. What I want to talk today about is Jesuit science. And why, the way I'm going to do it is to give you some small histories of a few Jesuit scientists, but then reflect on what we can learn from their lives. And the first Jesuit scientist I'm going to bring up is Ignatius himself. In the autobiography, we read, the greatest consolation that he received was from gazing at the sky and the stars, which he did often and for quite a long time. Now, he founded a group called the Society of Jesus, which I'm a member of, which we are fairly familiar with here, I hope. As the Society of Jesus, we're dedicated to becoming close to Jesus. Jesus, we believe, is God's incarnation in the physical universe. But it's important also that the first Jesuits were a group of men who had met at the University of Paris. Scholarship was an essential part of who they were and how they came to know each other and what brought them together. And from the beginning, it was at the highest level. It included theology and philosophy, yes, but also the subjects of the medieval quadrivium, mathematics, music, geometry, and astronomy. The heart of Ignatian spirituality is in the spiritual exercises, and most of you know, these are a series of prayers whose common theme is to place and identify God's presence in the physical universe, in specific times, specific places, in salvation history, in our own personal histories. And the exercises begin with what's called the principle and foundation. So that's up here. And you can read that for yourself. The part I've highlighted is the number of times that it mentions creation and things. We are created. We are things. All the things of this world have been created. Created things can lead us to God. And any created thing that doesn't lead us to God or to what God wants us to be isn't so necessarily evil, but just something that you can be indifferent to. The spirituality of Jesuits is all about our place in creation, why we were created, why the world was created, how we relate to creation. It leads to the famous Jesuit mantra, find God in all things. Being close to the created world is a way of being close to the creator. And so it's not surprising that science has played an important place in the postulates of the Jesuits. The first Jesuit I want to bring up is one of the early Jesuit scientists, Father Jose de Acosta. Born in Spain in 1540, the year that the society was established, he entered the Jesuits at age 13. In 1572, he was sent to the Americas as part of the third Jesuit expedition there, and he stayed there for 15 years. He traveled to Peru, to Bolivia, to Chile, to Mexico, and then he went back to Spain in 1587, where he had a number of university posts, but more importantly, played a real important role in the diplomacy between King Philip of Spain and the Pope and the Jesuits. And eventually he became the rector of the Jesuit College in Salamanca, and terrible fate for anybody to become a rector of a Jesuit community at a university. He died in 1600. But here's the point. When he got back to Spain, he wrote a number of books about his experiences, uh, notably <clears throat> De Natura Novus Orbis, On the Nature of the New World. And that was a description of the flora and fauna of the Americas. And then that was translated from Latin into Spanish and led to a series of seven books in Spanish that were collectively published as Natural and Social History of the Indies. Uh, the first three books were talked about geography, climate, geology, including earthquakes and volcanoes. The fourth book talks about the minerals and the plants and the animals. The final three books are about the peoples that he encountered in Peru and in the Indies and Mexico. Simply as a description of both the physical and sociological setting of the new world, it's a remarkable scientific record. But it's more than that. Notice that it's written in Spanish. A generation before Galileo, this Jesuit author is using the vernacular. 
popularizing the science, spreading it to an audience beyond just scholars who are fluent in Latin. The significance goes beyond that. There were other authors who had written about the unusual and strange things you could find in South America, but as Acosta writes, quote, till now I have not seen an author who dares to find the causes and reasons of the new and strange things in nature. Natural things which fall outside the generally accepted philosophy. You know, for example, the jungles that you find at the equator in South America are exactly the opposite of what Aristotle said you're going to always find at the equator, which is dry deserts like the Sahara. And Acosta says of Aristotle, he was a great philosopher, but he was wrong. That's a generation before Galileo makes that same point. Acosta talks about the trade winds. We know the trade winds are caused by the, the rotation of the Earth. He didn't know that the Earth rotated. He thought it was the celestial spheres outside the Earth rotating that caused the trade winds. He noted that the tides were the same in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and he attributed this to the action of the moon, which he got right and Galileo got wrong. He was the first person to describe altitude sickness. He actually was also the first to suggest that the indigenous peoples came originally from Asia over a land bridge between the Americas and Asia. And this was long before you know, Alaska and the Bering Straits had been discovered. Another early Jesuit about this time who was instrumental in science and mathematics was Christopher Clavius. He promoted mathematics as an important part of the curriculum in Jesuit schools. Before then, math was not considered as something that you, a, a, an adult would spend their time studying. But he said, no, this is essential to being a well-educated human being. He wrote textbooks throughout Europe. Uh, as I understand it, he actually invented what we call the decimal point. These books were used even beyond Jesuit schools. But since the Jesuits were missionaries, they carried them around the world. The thing he's probably best known for is his work with Pope Gregory in the reform of the calendar. Among other things, the calendar reform had this new way of calculating the date of Easter and all the other movable feasts that depend on Easter. It was a calculation. It was not based on observing where the moon was, but calculating a way that you could guess where the moon was going to be good enough. 20 years after if the, the, the promulgation of this in 1582, he came up with this book explaining the reform in great detail, and it included tables of the dates of Easter and other feasts all the way up to the year 5000. This page shows the dates of Septuagenema, Ash Wednesday, Easter, and the Ascension for those far off years 2021 and 2022. He was a generation ahead of Galileo, but they overlapped. And Galileo actually got Clavius to write him a letter of recommendation when he was trying to get a teaching job. Clavius lived long enough to look through Galileo's telescope and see Jupiter. And in fact, the Jesuits were among Galileo's early supporters. But there was this rivalry about who was the first to use telescopes for various things. And that led to a falling out. There were a number of Jesuits involved. I'm going to concentrate on Horatio Grassi. He and Galileo debated the nature of comets. Now, there were three comets visible to the naked eye that occurred in 1618. And Grassi was the first to observe them with a telescope. Galileo never saw them. Galileo was sick in bed that year. So Galileo observes the comets, and then he communicates with other Jesuits in the north of Germany who look at the same comet at the same time in the same day and its location relative to the background stars. Now, if you're looking at the moon from those two different places, the moon's position relative to the stars tends to shift. It's parallax. The moon is closer to us than the stars. They did not see any such parallax with the comets. And so from this, he concludes that the comets are farther away than the moon, and yet their orbit is so strange that it's hard to explain with circular orbits, which is what the Copernican system still demanded. And this was controversial because it seemed to, Coper to, to com conflict with the Copernican system. So over the next four years, Galileo and Grassi have this battle of booklets. And they're arguing the point back and forth. And ultimately, Galileo produces this book called The Assayer. It's his masterpiece of the philosophy of science, written in Italian, in beautiful Italian, with great wit and great sarcasm. 
And in it, Galileo says, your science has to depend not on the authority of some sage, but only on the data. And then using no data, but his own authority, he says, and of course those comets can't be out there beside, you know, beyond the earth, but that's a different story. And the important thing to remember is in those days, the Copernican system was not necessarily well supported by the science of the day. It took another 100 years before a lot of the holes in that system were filled. Jesuit scientists were among those who tried the hardest to examine the Copernican cosmology from a scientific point of view. And the most notable was probably Giovanni Battista Riccioli, who wrote his famous book 20 years after the Galileo trial. And he describes more than 80 arguments for and against the heliocentric system. And if you want to know more about this, I highly recommend a book by Christopher Greeney on this. He's one of the first people to actually translate uh, Riccioli in the last hundred years. And it's fascinating the things that Riccioli came up with. For instance, in the book, he describes <clears throat> what we now call the Coriolis force. And he says, if the Earth was spinning, you should be seeing deflections one way or the other, the way that the Coriolis force you know, causes hurricanes. We don't see it, therefore the Earth is not spinning. And that's all true. They didn't see it because it's a really subtle force and very hard to see. But they didn't know that at the time. More to the point, observations of the planets through a telescope like Galileo did were consistent with the Copernican system, but they were also consistent with Tycho Brahe's idea that the Earth is standing still, all the planets go around the sun still, but the sun is going around the Earth. And this allowed you to have an Earth that was stable and allowed you to have an Earth that did not move relative to the stars because no one could see parallax of the stars. And in fact, that parallax is so tiny that it was another couple of hundred years before people could see it. The thing that Riccioli is probably most famous for, though, is this famous map of the moon. He assigns the nomenclature we still use today. He names the seas, he names the mountains, and he names craters for prominent scientists. Notice here, the most prominent crater on the moon is named Crater Copernicus. And it's among a bunch of other craters that were named for other people that supported the heliocentric system, you know, uh, including um, Galileo and Kepler and Aristarchus. And actually, he puts himself on the moon along with his student Grimaldi and about two dozen other Jesuit scientists. The naming of features on planetary sciences continues today, and it follows the patterns that Riccioli set up, including using Jesuits and Latin grammar. As it happens, I currently serve as the chair of the Mars Task Group of the International Astronomical Union's Working Group on Planetary System Nomenclature. And I got that job, I think, because they think I know Latin. Fortunately, I know some Jesuits who do know Latin, and that's good enough. A contemporary of Riccioli who was important in his own way was Athanasius Kircher. He was the youngest of nine kids, entered the Society of Jesus at 14, got to the Roman College in 1633, which was the year of Galileo's infamous trial. He was a great supporter of what they were calling the new method of philosophy, based on observation and experiment and mathematics, as had been promoted by Galileo's assayer. But he was also kind of a weird mixture of the old and the new. He wrote three books using reason and mathematics to explain how Noah was able to fit all those animals on the ark. But he was a true polymath. He published books on hieroglyphics, on magnetism, on sundials, on optics, on acoustics, on music, astronomy, philology, logic, Chinese culture, Roman antiquities. And he organized the Kircher Museum of strange and weird things. You know, he misidentifies a lot of them, but you know, what is more hard to believe, a unicorn or a rhinoceros? <laughs> and he has horns that he is convinced are unicorn horns, narwhal horns, of course. But his most important role was in the compilation and publication of the work of other scientists. In those days, you didn't have scientific journals. So if you're doing science, how do you tell the rest of the scientific world? There were certain people, certain nodes, who you wrote to, and then he would pass these on to his correspondents. 
he winds up, there, there are other people who did this as well, Marine Mersenne, who was a French friar of the Minim Order, Robert Hooke, who was one of the early members of the Royal Society. Kircher's books are this weird and wonderful compilation of observations and theory, some of it outstanding, some of it utterly ridiculous, and he presents them all without evaluation or comment. He treats them as if they were scripture rather than trying to edit out what was good and what was bad. He thinks it's all sacred and it all has to be presented. His duty was to communicate the information, not to censor it. A hundred years later, you've got Roderick Boscovich, probably the greatest scientist of his century. Now, general, Jesuits have general congregations. We just had general congregation 36, about every 10 years to discuss you know, our way of proceeding. There was a general congregation 16 held in 1731 when Boscovich was 20. And what came out of it was the emphasis that Jesuit schools have to support the Aristotelian system. This is 100 years after Galileo. You have to support the Aristotelian system because all of their theology was based on Aristotle's philosophy. But the same general congregation also opened the door to the possibility of teaching experimental sciences. And so the Jesuit schools used this immediately to teach Newtonian physics. And that's what Boscovich learned. As a young man, he observed the transit of Mercury, Mercury passing between the Earth and the Sun. And as a result of that experience, he was later active in promoting transits of Venus, which I'll talk about in a bit. But his first fame was when he was in Rome in 1742, he noticed that there was a crack in the dome of St. Peter's, and he told the, the architects how to fix it, and it worked. That gave him great credibility in Rome so that he was started working to get the Vatican to lift the prohibition against teaching the heliocentric system, and that finally occurred in 15, 1757. Galileo's books were still on the index for another 50 years, but that's a different story. Of his many works, the most notable was probably the Theoria Philosophiae Naturalis, 1758, which is the origin of the modern atomic theory of matter. But, but go back to that 1757 heliocentrism is lifted. Three years later, this painting is painted on the ceiling of the mathematics room of the Jesuit College in Prague. And you can see all those little angels looking through, your students are all little angels, right? <laughs> looking through telescopes at stars surrounded by planets with comets. 1760. I mentioned the, the transits of Venus. The observations of transits of Venus occur when Venus passes in front of the sun and this occurs twice, separated by 12 years, every 120 years or so. And so there are two transits in 1761 and 1769. And observing these was arguably one of the most important things that was done in 18th century science. Because when you can measure the, the tra trace of Venus across the sun from two widely separated positions on the Earth, whose distance you know, then you can triangulate and calculate the distance to Venus in whatever you know, miles or kilometers or whatever you're using for distance measurements. And why, by knowing the distance from the Earth to Venus, then you can work out the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and which is the astronomical unit, and that's the first step in the distance ladder that eventually allows you to work out the distance to nearby stars, and then the size of the galaxy, and then the distance to other galaxies, and ultimately, you know, what leads you to be able to calculate the Big Bang and the Hubble constant. Everything depends on this first measurement, which was done in 1761. At the time of the transits, about 25% of all the observatories in Europe were run by Jesuits, plus all the Jesuits who were missionaries on the other side of the world. So they played a big role. One of the most prominent observatories was the Vienna University Observatory, which Father Maximilian Hell had founded in 1755. So in 1769, for the second transit, he's invited to go to Lapland to make an observation in the northern part of Scandinavia by the King of Sweden. Okay, that's nice. At that time, Jesuits were specifically forbidden by law for setting foot in Protestant Sweden. 
So the king gave him special permission because he recognized him as one of the great astronomers of the day. Of course, in the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773, the observatory was taken over by the state. In the following years, the people running it tended to be anti-clerical. So about 50 years later, 1835, the director of the observatory, Joseph Johann von Litzrow, was going through Maximilian Hell's notes, and he accused him of falsifying his data. The problem was that Hell was late publishing his results. It happens, OK? And by the time his results were published, there were already calculations of the distance of the astronomical unit, and Hell's observations fit perfectly. And Littrow thought, ah, too good to be true. Indeed, he starts looking at them and he says, ah, looks to me like the ink used in some of the entries was a different color. Maybe they were written in after the fact. That became the received wisdom by the middle of the 19th century, because Hal was a fake. After all, he was a duplicitous Jesuit. What do you expect? Except this article by the American astronomer Simon Newcomb in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1883 says, Newcomb says, the, current, the present writer was perplexed to find himself differing entirely from the conclusions of Littrow when he looked at those data. And eventually he found out that Littrow was colorblind. So how could he have you know, claimed to see changes in color? This exonerated Maximilian Hell. But it's also kind of curious because Simon Newcomb himself had the reputation of the kind of guy who would try to destroy the careers and reputations of his rivals. He was such a bad guy that rumor has it he was the model that Arthur Conan Doyle used for the evil Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Into the 19th century, the most notable of Jesuit scientists was Angelo Secchi, and I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about him because he's amazing. His birth was in 1818, so we celebrated the bicentennial a couple of years ago. A number of books have come out. The most recent, the one to the right, I was actually an editor of. His output was remarkable. He built an electromechanical gizmo that would automatically record meteorological data, pressure and temperature, so you didn't have to have somebody sitting next to a barometer every hour writing these things down. He set up a system of weather reporting that used the telegraph so he could find out what was the weather to the west. And maybe that's the weather we're going to have you know, today. He provided practical applications of science to civic life in you know, the Papal States, which is where he was working. He organized timekeeping. He uh, worked out the proper drainage of the cities. He established standards for reinforcing buildings against earthquakes. He set up the first magnetic observatory in Italy. He invented this thing called the Secchi disk, which is a disk with lines on it that you put in water. And how deep you can go before you can't see the water, the lines anymore, tells you how clear the water is. Secchi disks are still used to this day to, to measure the, the clarity of water. He worked out uh, the origin of hail. He worked out what you know, the causes of other weather phenomena. He installed sundials and lighthouses in the Papal States. He surveyed the Appian Way. He played a key role in revising the metric system. None of that is what he's most famous for, because he did two other things that were really important to me. He invented the field we now call astrophysics and he invented the field we now call planetary sciences. He did all of this in a period of about 25 years during the politically turbulent times in Italy from the 1850s through the 1870s, and he died young at age 59. It's worth spending a little time to get to know. Okay, born in 1818 from a middle-class family in a part of Italy called Reggio Emilia. Does anybody here remember the old Don Camillo books? I don't know how many of you read those. In the, in, you know, they were very popular. Anyway, this is, you know, Don Camillo was from Reggio Emilia. And if you ever saw the movies, it's the same wild and wonderful territory. It's north of Bologna. He entered the Society of Jesus when he was 15. By the time he's 23, he's teaching physics at the high school that the Jesuits have in Loretto. In 
1844, he goes back to the Roman College to study theology, and he's ordained a priest in 1847, 29 years old. The next year, 1848, was one of those years of tremendous upheaval throughout Europe, revolutions everywhere. In November, Garibaldi's armies enter Rome, Pope Pius IX is forced to flee to Naples, the Jesuits are expelled from Rome, there's a new Roman Republic set up. In exile, Secchi first goes to Stonyhurst College in the north of England, and that's probably where he learned astronomy. He had been a physicist before then, but there's a beautiful observatory there. They still have the telescope. The next year, Secchi moves from there to Georgetown University in the US. And among the people he meets there is Maury, who is the, the head of the Naval Observatory and one of the grandfathers of um, meteorology. So he's learning meteorology from Maury, who incidentally was a racist SOB, but that's a whole different story. In July, the French army marches into Rome, kicks out the rebels, Pius IX is reinstalled, and Rome itself and the area right around it is reestablished as the Papal States, but only that small area. The following year, Secchi comes back to Rome and he's named director of the Roman College Observatory, 31 years old, ordained two years. The first thing he does is to put telescopes on the roof of the St. Ignatius Church. I don't know how many of you have been to Rome, have seen the Church of St. Ignatius. It was a church that was supposed to have a big dome, but they ran out of money. So it's got a flat ceiling and a dome painted in perspective. It's really weird. You, at the front of the church, it looks like a real dome, and then you walk underneath it, and it's like, oh, it's kind of weird. The point was that there were four big pillars designed to carry the weight of the dome that didn't have anything on them, so he put his telescopes on those four pillars. Incidentally, the guy who designed the church was Horatio Grassi, the same guy who was in trouble with God. It all ties together. But it's here that Secchi starts doing his astronomy. He gets a marvelous telescope made by Mertz around 1860, one of the best in the world at that time. Not the biggest, but the best. And to get a sense of what it looked like, this is a photograph from 1904. At this point, the observatory had been taken over by the Italian government. The telescope was eventually moved to a different observatory in Monte, Mar uh, Monte Mario, and then it was lost in a fire in the 1950s, very sadly. I first got up there in 2001, and this is kind of what it looks like now. There, there are astronomers who are trying to clean it up. They're not going to put telescopes back there, but they're remembering Secchi. When you look across at the horizon, you can see why this was such a great place. It's on a slight hill and you can see a clear horizon in every direction. That dome in the front, that's the Pantheon. The, uh, the dome in the rear, that's St. Peter's. Of course, there were no city lights then, so this is a fantastic place to do astronomy. Um, the great American astronomer, Maria Mitchell, visited Rome. Secchi invited her to come to the observatory. Then somebody in the church said, oh, to get to the observatory, you have to go at the altar and women aren't allowed there, so he worked out a deal where she brought some flowers to the altar, you know. <laughs> the day of the visit fell through because she was a single woman and the Italian police would not let her walk the streets alone after dark. That's what you know, the world was like in the 19th century. Among the science that Osaki did was studying the sun. He went to observe a solar eclipse in 1860. It was the first one to be photographed. And you see that spot of light around the shadow of the moon. That's called the corona. He compared his photographs with photographs that other people took elsewhere, and they saw that the corona was the same, which said the corona is actually attached to the sun. It's not just some atmospheric effect. That was fundamental and important. He went on to make these incredibly detailed observations of sunspots and solar spicules, and he noted that solar activity, the number of sunspots, was related to fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field. This turns out to be really important to us nowadays because when there are solar storms, this will affect the transmission of electricity and long lines, you know, from the, the dams in northern Canada, or cell phone coverage or whatever. Uh, there are a pair of NASA satellites called the stereo satellites that look at the sun from two different points of view and they have an instrument to measure solar activity. 
The instrument is called the Sun-Earth Connection Coronal and Heliospheric Investigation Package. There is fame to have your name turned into a NASA acronym. Uh, I'm waiting for them to figure out something for Consul Magno, but <laughs> maybe too many letters. But I mentioned, as important as any of that would be, the most important was his invention of astrophysics. What do I mean? Well, let's go back and look at what's going on in the philosophy of science in those days. Um, we've got, in the 1820s, Fraunhofer is taking spectra of the sun and the bright star Sirius, and he noticed that when you, you know, put the light through a prism and you see the spectrum, they look different. But that's all he says. Nobody follows it up. The common wisdom was, in fact, that astronomers didn't look at spectra. Astronomers looked at positions. Frederick Bessel, 1832, writes, what astronomy must do has always been clear. Lay down the rules for determining the motions of heavenly bodies as they appear to us from Earth. Everything else that can be learned about the heavenly bodies is not properly of astronomical interest. Not only can't you, you shouldn't even try. 1835, the French philosopher Kant writes, every research in relation to the stars not reducible in the end to simple visual observations is perforce barred to us. We could never study by any means their chemical composition or their mineral structure. Our positive knowledge concerning the stars is necessarily restricted to just their mechanical phenomena. It's impossible to measure anything about their physics. He's using this as an example of knowledge that we know exists, but we will never know. Of course, what does Secchi do? 1859, Kirchhoff and Bunsen show that when you have the light spread out into a spectrum and there are lines of light missing, that's because there are chemicals in the light path which absorb those particular wavelengths of light, and that will tell you what chemicals are present. Secchi follows this up by putting a big prism in front of his main lens of his big telescope, and so every star that he looks at becomes a spectrum. And after that, he starts systematically observing 5,000 stars, all by eye, no photography available yet. He notes the differences between stars whose spectra are filled with the lines and those that don't have lines. He noticed those lines positions differ from the sun's but are identical to carbon seen in the lab. We call those carbon stars now. We see that the sun is just one of a particular kind of star. That stars aren't an infinite number of different varieties, but they come in distinct classes. In making this systematic classification, he changes the question of astronomy from where are the stars to what are the stars? What are they made of? How do they get to be that way? It leads eventually to something called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which is fundamental to every astrophysicist. It really is the invention, the foundation of everything in astrophysics. Secchi does this in the 1860s. He continued this pattern of asking not only where but what with his observations of the planets. He gets spectra of the atmospheres of Jupiter and the outer planets and finds carbon there. He looks at Mars and famously describes some of the dark regions using the word canali in Italian. Later, you know, Scafarelli and, and uh, Percival Lowell are gonna pretend to see thin lines which they think are real canals. What Secchi is describing are real and they can be identified with features you can see on Mars today. But let's go back to the political time. Rome is occupied in 1870. Basically, Bismarck attacks France. The French take the army out of Rome to defend Paris. Garibaldi's troops march in. Everything except the Vatican is overrun. The Vatican is you know, held off. They decide not to invade. The Pope declares himself a prisoner of the Vatican, but still a member of an independent. Yeah, the Vatican is now you know, the, the world's tiniest nation. Secchi's observatory, of course, is in the middle of Rome. He gives up his chairmanship of the astrophysics department there, even though the Italian government wants to keep him because his reputation is so good. They, um, 
there's a law passed that all of this material, all the church property is going to be confiscated by the state, but their deal is made so that Secchi can continue his work. He was finally made the director of the observatory again in 1876, but he died of stomach cancer two years later. Scampanelli, who was probably the great astronomer of the following generation as a young man, writes in his notebook on the night of February 26th, while I'm making these observations at 7.15 Rome time, Father Secchi died. Thus has Italy been deprived of its principal and most distinguished astronomer. I'm not finished with Secchi. <laughs> One last thing to describe about him. In 1867, Paris has a World's Fair. All the nations are invited to come, come with, with gizmos and things to show off their nations. The, whole, the Holy See is still in existence at that point. And Secchi brings that mechanical gizmo that records the weather. He gets the gold medal for this. He gets awarded the Legion of Honor by Napoleon III. He gets a ton of money, which he you know, uses to improve his observatory. A French contemporary writes, without Father Secchi, the Papal States exhibit would not have been put in a good light. Secchi himself writes, hurrah for religion in the cassock. Today, that was crowned rather than me. Because as Kenichi, the biographer, points out, awarding this prize to a Jesuit was a jab at the anti-clerical party who accused the church of obscurantism and hostility to science. And this was noted at the Vatican. In that same year, in France, they proposed to redefine the meter and all the benefits of the metric system it had been established during the French Revolution, but now with you know 19th century instruments, they could measure it much more precisely. A commission is formed in 1870. Secchi is nominated to play a key role in this position, but then in the fall, Napoleon III falls, Italy falls, Rome falls, declare, Italy declares the Holy See no longer exists, and the Pope is a you know, prisoner of the Vatican. Two years later, the Committee of 1870 expresses the wish, in spite of the changed conditions of the Holy See, that it not be denied the contribution of Father Secchi, which are of great benefit to the work of the committee. Ha! Huh. If Secchi is allowed to continue to work, this is de facto recognizing the Holy See as a nation, and the Italians will have none of that. So the... <clears throat> A telegram was sent from the uh, Minister Plenipotentiari in Paris to the French foreign minister. Father Secchi was sent here to take part in the work of the Commission of the Meter. He was received as a representative of the Holy See. Please make known to me if there is a place to ask for explanations from the French government to express our reservations about this. Now, the Italian scientists there are telling him, don't do this. Everybody respects Secchi, we're gonna come off looking stupid, but governments being governments, the Italian foreign minister insists, the government of the King of Italy cannot let pass in silence the designation made in the French official gazette of a state that no longer exists. He orders the Italian delegates to protest, to refuse to take part in the commission. Secchi participates, he's allowed to vote, he represents the Holy See, the Italians abstain, and they're kicked off the commission. Secchi returns home. Back home, he's received an audience by Pope Pius IX. In his diary, he writes, the Pope welcomed me with a hand raised saying, I vote for Father Secchi. So the Holy See recognizes that having a national observatory is a way of getting recognized as a nation, which was highly controversial at the time. There's something else going on, though. The same upheavals that you know, led to Secchi having to run away in 1848 kept going, and it you know, colored the nature of Jesuit science. Scientific work before then was mostly done by the clergy. I mean, who else besides noblemen and clergymen had the education and the free time to do science? So you go to the you know, philosophical transactions, and it's very often the reverend so-and-so who's writing a, an article. But by the middle of the 1800s, by the 1870s, this relationship between science and religion is under a tremendous stress. 
First of all, there was this Enlightenment anti-clericalism, the idea that science is going to replace religion. You know, electricity and steam engines will solve all of our problems. There was this Whig myth that eventually progress is going to triumph over older ways of thought. In, the, in Germany, there's a secular university where you had to pay to get educated and as opposed to the church school. So they wanted to, you know, why should you pay us? Well, we're because we're not tied to these ancient and obsolete ideas of the past. The anti-clerical Italian government turns Galileo into a martyr of the church, which is historically not accurate. Galileo, the Galileo affair doesn't make the church look any better, but it's not what you think it was. Worse than that, they turned Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake for being a, a heretic, into a modern martyr of science. If you actually read Bruno's stuff, you realize he was a crackpot. He was a crank. He was a nasty bit of goods. He's not somebody that I would want representing science. But they've got this statue to him in the middle of, uh, of the Vatican, and in the middle of Rome. At the same time, in America, you've got books like Andrew Dixon White's the History of Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. Andrew Dixon White was the guy who founded Cornell University. His real argument is that people who come from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe with vowels at the end of their names, like Consul Magno, are dangerous to America because we all know they're anti-science. And that, of course, led to eventually quotas. In 1924, the Immigration Act cut Italian immigration by 90%. You know, my grandfather would not have been able to come here if he had come after 1924. And that wasn't repealed for another 40 years, not till the 60s. This also led to the eugenics movement. It tried to use Darwin's ideas of evolution in order to breed superior human beings and eliminate the unfit. And we all know who the unfit are. They're the people who don't look like you and me. And there's social Darwinism which is a system that used Darwinism as an excuse for maintaining the rigid social classes and racial discrimination. The church spoke out against these things and therefore was accused of being anti-science. And you read, you know, H.G. Wells, you read a lot of the popularizers of science at that time, and they were all really big into eugenics. Of course, there was the other side of this where the church reacted with kind of triumphalism, the sense that, ah, We've got the truth. We don't need the modern world. And this was manifest especially in the First Vatican Council under Pope Pius IX, which was cut short when Garibaldi's armies marched into the Vatican. But remembering how Secchi gave credit to the church, the next pope, Leo XIII, hires one of Secchi's assistants to start a Vatican observatory on the walls of the Vatican to show that the church is not anti-science and oh yeah, we're a nation. One of the first things they do is take part in a program where 18 nations got identical telescopes, this was the Vatican's, that would each, each of these 18 national observatories was given a piece of the sky to photograph to make a good map of the sky called the Carte du Ciel. The Vatican has one part of the sky, Italy has a different part of the sky. There are a number of people who run the observatory until 1906. Father Hagen was the first Jesuit to come in. And after that time, Jesuits have been given the, the role of staffing the observatory. If you don't know Father Hagen, take a look at this piece of stained glass in Baft's library. By the 1930s, finally Italy is made up with the Vatican, the Holy See, the Vatican City State is recognized. And the territory that the Vatican had out in Castel Gandolfo was given to the popes. They set up this laboratory where they measure the spectra of pure metals to compare those spectra against what you see in stars. They found a journal called Spectra Chimica Acta, still published to this day. After the war, it was actually printed at the Vatican because that was one of the few places that had a, a functioning printing press. Before I go on more about the observatory, I want to mention one other Jesuit scientist. James McElwaney, born on a farm in Clinton, Ohio in 1883, one of eight kids. He had to leave high school at 15 to work on the farm. Then he entered the Jesuits in 1903. While he's studying philosophy in St. Louis, he shows an aptitude for the sciences. And each of the Jesuit schools in those days had a little seismometer. He was fascinated by this. So they send him off to Berkeley, where he writes the first PhD thesis on seismology in North America. 
Of course, Berkeley is located right on top of the San Andreas Fault. This is, you know, an ideal. What do the Jesuits do then? They pull him back to St. Louis to teach. Well, even though he does no longer in an earthquake zone, he continues to set up a lab where he measures the velocity of uh, seismic waves through rocks. He also revives something called the Jesuit Seismological Association, where he gets the seismometers in all these Jesuit schools to talk to each other. There was one here at Boston College for many years. There is one at Fordham. And he got them to all, because if there's an earthquake, and you can measure the exact time the wave of the earthquake comes to Boston compared to when it comes to New York, compared to when it comes to Cleveland, you can triangulate to find out where was the earthquake in the Earth. This gives you a sense of where are the earthquakes, not only above, but inside the Earth. It gives you a sense of the structure because you can see reflections between the crust and the mantle, the mantle and the core. You can also use these seismic waves to detect the location and the strength of underground nuclear tests. And so with this evidence worked out in 1963, the government takes over to in upgrade all of these to come up with a way of proving that the Russians are not cheating in the test ban treaty. McElwenny stayed in St. Louis for the rest of his life. He died of liver disease in 56. He continued doing that fundamental research, but also research in tornadoes and hurricanes. So he promoted the study of meteorology. He wrote class and textbooks for a whole new generation of both seismologists and meteorologists. There are two prizes named for McElwaney. The American Geophysical Union awards the McElwaney Medal for outstanding work by a young scientist, and the American Meteorological Society gives the McElwaney Award for outstanding students. A remarkable man. Back to the observatory. The Vatican Observatory plays an active role today in astronomy, including international astronomy, the IAU. Uh, the fellow in the center there is Father Chris Corbelly. He was the guy who wrote the definition that described why Pluto is not a planet, but a dwarf planet. And you can see Jocelyn Bell Burnell holding Pluto so that she can explain to people what's going on. At the observatory today, we've got doctor, people with doctorates from all over the world in a wide range of field, all having studied at some of the great universities in the world. One of the cool things about at, being at the observatory is that I don't have to worry about renewing my grants every three years. I get money for long-term work, and that means I get to do long-term survey projects, like measuring the spectra of, of you know, all these different metals. They may take 10 or 20 years to come to fruition. It's science that the rest of the world relies on, but nobody else is gonna pay for. Sometimes it's called orphan science. An example is the work that you know, my colleague Bob Mackey and I, and Cy Peel are working on in the physical properties of meteorites. First time I you know, measured meteorite densities and, and presented it at a meeting, one of the grand old men of the field came, Guy, why are you doing these measurements? Nobody does this. Well, yeah, that's why I'm doing it, because I know we need it. And the fact that it took 10 years and going around the world measuring thousands of samples, which is what Bob did for his thesis, meant eventually we have the data that the rest of the world relies on. Bob is now a participating scientist on the recent NASA mission OSIRIS-REx. He'll be involved in measuring the samples that they're bringing back from the asteroid. He's a, a member of the Lucy mission that's gonna launch in October to explore asteroids out beyond Jupiter. Let's take a look now, as we conclude, as to what this tells us about being a Jesuit scientist. Being a Jesuit in science has advantages, but also problems. You get to study. I mean, think of the, the guys who, you know, number 14 in their family, would never have gotten an education except that they joined the Jesuits and the Jesuits educated them. On the other hand, the Jesuits force you to then study theology and philosophy, which takes up another 10 years of your life. So it can be a long time before you can use your other studies. Jesuit scientists can be sent to exotic places. When Acosta went to Peru, that would be like going into space today. Who gets to do that? But the Jesuits sent Acosta and paid for him to go and explore this marvelous place. On the other hand, you're also then called back to do other things. 
There was Father Jim Salmon in my province, was a marvelous chemist who worked in chaos theory of chemical reactions until the provincial said, oh, you're a scientist, you can handle numbers, we need a treasurer for the province. <laughs> that international network of Jesuits allows you to do things like Grassic, who could talk to you know, Jesuits up in the north of Germany, something that Galileo couldn't do, and also gives you a, 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 you know, a net so that Secchi had a place to go when he was kicked out of Rome. But it also means that you're likely to be kicked out of Rome because you're a Jesuit and you, know, you get involved with the politics of the day. Being a Jesuit gives you instant credibility. In some places, I've had the chance to do things I couldn't have otherwise. But it also carries with it a lot of prejudice. Secchi's work was never translated into English because the British scientists of the 19th century were so fiercely anti-clerical. The expectations of the church can put strains on how you present your work. No matter what I do, people are thinking that I'm going to represent the church. You know, my scientific theories are somehow the church's official teaching. Well, no, but people are going to think that. And I have to say, present myself in a way that's not going to bring scandal to the church, which I try. Uh, you know, my own scientific work, working with meteorites, rocks that fall from space, these meteorites from Mars, don't ask me either from Mars, I can, you know, takes another talk. The one in the center was donated to the Vatican by a collector. It's worth millions. We were able to slice it up into a number of thin sections at the British Museum by the best thin section maker in the world. He did it for free because I was a Jesuit at the Vatican. Those thin sections have gone on to be the basis of most of the scientific papers published in the last 25 years on this meteorite because I'm willing to loan it out to people. You couldn't do that kind of work if you were stuck in a three-year grant cycle. We're able to take our equipment to meteorite collections around the world because we're not only worried about being paid, but you know, when Bob went around the world, there was generally a Jesuit community he could stay at nearby. But you know, Bob also had the problem by the time he was able to set up his own lab, he was well into his 40s. And while none of our work has led to scandal within the church, you know, if I cut corners, it's going to show up. And there are plenty of people who want to attach scandal to us anyway, regardless of what we do. You know, the, the UFOs are all part of a Vatican plot. But here's the final point. The kind of work we do, the science that everybody needs but no one else is willing to do, sometimes means that the work we do isn't appreciated in certain quarters. There was a 19th century British Whig historian Thomas Macaulay. And he once wrote, being a Jesuit has a tendency to suffocate rather than develop original genius. Of course, this is at the same time that Secchi is doing all that fabulous work, but Macaulay didn't know that because he didn't read Italian. But it really goes to what it means to do Jesuit science, the motivation behind the work. The spoken, unspoken assumption of somebody like Macaulay is that you do science for the glory of the genius. But to a Jesuit, the glory that comes from the science is the greater glory of God, the creator, not the glory for the person who happens to have found it or the person who got the grant money. The research itself is a form of prayer. In other words, we do it for love, the love of the science itself, the love of the truth, the love of the church who brings us to the author of the truth, the love of the creator in whom we find, whom we find in all created things. Thank you very much. I've I've run a little long and it's after one o'clock, so if people have to leave, I completely understand. But uh, can we stay for a couple of questions if people want? Shout, feel free to shout. And I'll tr if I hear you, I'll try to respond. You know, repeat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
People should, you know, no, definitely, that, that certainly I'm not going to argue that one. Right. The interesting thing, um, I've been accused in some of my theories of being crackpot. And I agree, we need the crackpots. But if you're going to be a crackpot, you should also provide service to the rest of the community so that you're not known only for your crackpot stuff. I think you have to pay your dues. Science is a conversation, and if you're trying to pull the science into a direction that people aren't ready for yet, in some ways you could argue that uh, Bruno's idea of multiple stars being multiple universes set the field back 100 years because it put a bad odor on an idea that, you know, uh, actually had been suggested by Nicholas of Cusa 200 years earlier. I say he was burned at the stake for uh, plagiarism, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but you do have a point. We need to be free to have wild ideas, but we also need to be engaged in the community and to recognize that this is a luxury. This can't be the core of, of what we do. Yeah. Didn't know that. For observational uh, seismology. And so, excuse me, the award is actually going to be given um, next month to a scientist. So the JSA still lives on at the Eastern University. That's wonderful. I know when I was a postdoc at MIT in the early 80s, I was working with Nafi Taxos, who did half of his work in planetary, and that was what was supporting me, but the other half working on the, the Weston Observatory, and the seismometers were down the hall from my office, or the, the recording instruments, I, sh I should say. So yeah, it, but it, it's a marvelous uh, part of the history of Jesuit science that these observatories were set up, these and meteorological observatories and astronomical observatories around the world. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, well, I had at one time a marvelous explanation for some of the strange uh, chemistry we saw on the moon. And it had to do with you know, the, the, the theory of the impact origin of the moon and I thought I could hand wave my way into explaining the strange chemistry we see in lunar craters. Unfortunately, the GRAIL mission showed that most of those ideas we had about the moon were wrong. So I had a perfect explanation for something that wasn't true. <laughs> this happens. Anyone else then? Thanks a whole lot for coming. I hope you had a great lunch.